So what is knowledge? You know, the Oxford Dictionary defines knowledge as the sum of what is known. But much more interestingly, it's often been said that knowledge is power. And I find that to be so true. Because I felt truly powerless seven years ago. You see, I was a graduate student at the time who had a deep passion for business. And one fine day, a friend of mine approached me with this fantastic business idea to be developed in Hong Kong. Now, there's just one issue though. He wanted me to come on board and invest a large portion of my savings into it. Obviously, that's how he can start a business. And the greatest issue is that both my friend and I, we have never lived in Asia. We're third culture kids. So I felt very much in the dark. In a way, I felt blind as well. I had no reference point in terms of experience to make an informed decision. So what did I do? I did what most graduate students were trained to do. I went to the library, the bookstores, and I found, loaned, and I purchased every single publication that I could find on doing business in Asia. You know, from titles like The Economist to titles that we're even afraid to admit that we read, like the Four Dummies book, yeah, I went that low. Information on the internet was really non-existent at the time in this area. Websites like ours seven years ago was just not there. And honestly, all in all, after doing all that, I still felt in the dark. But I told myself that I'm young, you only live once, so I decided to take, you know, a leap of faith, take the plunge and do it. You know, you hear success stories like that. So I took the plunge. One year later, I am proud to say that I lost all my savings. The business failed miserably. And I can see on some of your faces right now the sense of confusion. I am proud because it was such a tragic failure on a monumental level that I was so shaken that I really sat down and I thought about what happened. And one thing I realized in that moment was that knowledge truly was power because if only I had known what I'd known much earlier, it could have been much different. In that sense, I was powerless. But I was also inspired at the same time that I never wanted to experience this ever again. And I never want others to experience what I had experienced that I thought I had to do something about it. I had to fill this knowledge gap that I faced. So what I, what I did next was I eventually started a magazine in Harvard University, a magazine dedicated to educating people on the insights and the experiences of Asian entrepreneurship. No longer should there be a veil. No longer should we feel like power, we're in the dark and powerless. No longer should people feel like there's an impediment to actually you know, making a decision that I had to make. Very quickly, within a year, it really picked up. You know, we achieved major readership and distribution points within the country. Very shortly, we made profit. Things went well in a way. But deep inside, I've always felt it's not enough. What about the people out there? People halfway across you know, the world, the globe, away from the US. People who be facing the same issues that I faced. How do we get to them? It was incredibly expensive and physically challenging to do so. But we deliberated on that for a long time. What we did next was we took the radical step and we went online. And this was a really important turning point in the publication itself. Because six years later, today, standing here before you, at this very TED Talk, once again, I'm proud. But this time, proud with the substance. Because we have now developed the largest content database for Asian entrepreneurship, educating readers from 22 countries every single day with over 600 writers contributing to us every single month. Now today I really want to talk really briefly about this shift, this incredible journey, what we learned from it, what it means for knowledge creation in the age of digital media. You see, the internet has really become the great information highway. At no point ever in human history have we ever had such great 
and easy access to the sheer volume of information that you can actually find online. The internet has made accessing knowledge so convenient that it truly is revolutionary. I mean, it's really given us an ability to gain knowledge in a way never before possible by eliminating the physical constraints that are the impediments to its dissemination. Now, if you find this to be underwhelming, then consider this. In the past, knowledge was largely disseminated in physical form, in written publications, accessible in academia, libraries, and bookstores. Today, however, with the flick of a few you know, buttons on your smartphones, your mobile devices, your computers, you can immediately engage yourself in the vast pools of network uh, knowledge online, information online, and that's just incredible. At no points ever in history have we been able to do that, and no longer are we bound by the physical. And without the physical constraints, we can actually now disseminate and spread knowledge globally. And that truly is quite incredible in itself. So if you're truly committed like we are towards commit, you know, creating knowledge for the world, realistically, the internet is where you need to start. Digital media is where you need to get into. This is something that we experienced with the Asian entrepreneur, because when we first started, as a print publisher. Demographically, we could only reach Boston and the greater East Coast area. Now, it makes perfect sense because those were the access points to our, our work. But since reinventing ourselves digitally, we've been able to create world access to our work you know, from places as far as Mongolia, which is quite surprising for us. The important takeaway that we got from this is that when knowledge is available in digital form through digital media, anyone can access it from anywhere at any time, realizing the true potential of knowledge creation. This is important. With the current trend of knowledge being more accessible through digital media, and also how now it's more democratic in the way that a lot of the content online is now free, knowledge is actually now democratized. What do I mean by this? Well, the spread and the acquisition of knowledge is no longer reserved for the privileged elite. It's now accessible to common people. No longer is knowledge limited to a place that can afford a great library, great university, or people who can afford great books, great resources. This is an especially important consideration when you take into account the rural areas and underdeveloped communities around the world. Many of these areas, they do not have the educational facilities, the basic infrastructures that we're used to in developed countries. And as such, you can imagine creating and spreading knowledge in these places would be incredibly difficult through the conventional route. But what they do have, with the global diminishing cost of smartphones and the ever-expanding uh, rate of internet access, is a very effective bridge to facilitate access to information online. Hence, digital media plays an ever more important role in empowering such communities by creating access to knowledge for them, by democratizing knowledge for them. But much more than that, digital media has also fundamentally transformed the very act of knowledge production itself. To understand why, we have to understand how knowledge was produced in the past. You know, in the old traditional model of print publishing, you'd have an author who would submit his written work, comprising his knowledge and his research to a publisher who would then vet it, obviously because publishing, understandably, is a heavy investment of time, if not money after which hopefully it would then be published, printed, distributed, and then readers finally have access to it. Now this represents a very top-down type of knowledge production process with the author and the print publisher being on the very top as the publishing elite. And then information is finally presented, knowledge is presented in a fixed format, you know, through this very grueling process. And because of it, you know, because this process is not really easy to be a part of, it's not that accessible for people, it's seen as having great authority, and it's how we've been consuming knowledge and presented with knowledge for the longest time. But there are several inherent problems with the traditional model that's worthy of highlighting. First of all, the publications themselves, they're static. They immediately become obsolete whenever new information is available. I mean, you can think of numerous examples of how if you have a first edition book from way back, it's just hilariously, blatantly wrong. But secondly, and more importantly, the publications in general, they do not showcase the diverse 
dissenting and alternative views, contrary to those that are actually being presented by the authors. And this is a very important point, because very rarely does knowledge boil down to absolutist claims and notions. To think so would be to have a very isolated view of the world. But despite these shortfalls, this has been how knowledge has been produced for hundreds of years, because the book and the paper were really the only possible mediums to effectively deliver information. But that's no longer the case today. With the advent of the internet, anyone can share and publish online knowledge without being constrained by some grueling publication process. And that's important because if you think about it for a second, consider this, how easy is it for any of us right now to publish something on Twitter, on Tumblr, on WordPress, on Medium, and all these other av avenues? Because of the sheer ease of access to actually publish, we are now producing more information every 10 minutes online than we ever did in all of human history. And that's just incredible. Now, if we can somehow appropriately harness and utilize the collective power to produce information, to produce relevant information about a subject matter, then that in itself could be an equally substantial, if not a better form of knowledge production than what has been done before. Because if you're able to provide an accessible avenue where people can collectively input and share knowledge, then with enough time and the right critical mass, you'd be able to accumulate and eventually ultimately produce the most diverse and dynamic amount of knowledge that you can never replicate in any publication because it'd just be physically impossible to do so. And through that, you'd be, you'd be able to actually achieve the most comprehensive and holistic view of any subject matter that you could just never do before. And that allows us to really attain dialecticism, this belief that truth can only be realized when you're able to effectively showcase and juxtapose different points of view. This wisdom of the crowd that I'm alluding to, this collective, uh, collectively produced knowledge I'm alluding to, is not a new idea. It's actually an idea that's traceable back to antiquity, to the works of the greats such as Aristotle, who in his theory of collective judgment, use a potluck dinner as a great example. Imagine a potluck dinner. Obviously, a group of people preparing a feast would achieve something much more advantageous, much more satisfying than what one person could do alone. And this philosophy of crowdsourcing, of using the crowd for this major benefit, is now today realizable because of the internet. And it's also applicable to content production through digital media. And you know, as radical as this seems as an idea, as maybe incomprehensible to some of you, this has actually been largely attempted by several notable knowledge brokers, such as Wikipedia, Quora. At the Asian Entrepreneur, I really had the opportunity to see this firsthand, because since reinventing ourselves digitally, we modeled ourselves after an open access crowdsource model of publication, something like Wikipedia, where you know, we actually are one of the few publications out there today where we openly invite and actively welcome writers and authors from all over the world on the web to directly participate in our content production. Quite literally, anyone can publish on our platform. We have an open policy. The only time when we would intervene is when there's clear commercialization or vandalism or when a person is completely off tangent. But otherwise, we don't. We truly want to realize this collective knowledge. And I can tell you this, since having moved from the traditional model of print publishing, where you know, we started as being a printed magazine, we hired, selected, vetted for authors to write for us, to this new model, radical model, where we have amassed hundreds of writers from all over the world from different social and professional backgrounds and competencies, the results were stark. Where we used to have individualistic pieces, you know, penned by the same authors, usually in the similar th tones and themes, we now have thousands upon thousands of multifaceted articles of different and varying perspectives. And you know what? The great surprise is this. Since this shift, our readers have found our work to be much more relevant, more comprehensive, more diverse, more impactful, more empowering than ever before. And it's only something that you can realize through digital media today. But more than that, digital media is also transforming you, every one of you, the readers, 
In this day and age, digital media has moved the readers from their former passive roles as mere receivers of knowledge to more active role of being a co-creator of knowledge as well, where you can add to it, spread it, debate it. I'm going to give you an example. You could read an article on the Asian entrepreneur right now, and maybe you get yourself engaged with a forum debate discussion you know, within our platform. Maybe it doesn't go so well for you. You go on Twitter, start to spread your opinions, and try and get some people to back you up. No retweets. Maybe you try and start a Facebook hate club, get validation for your idea. Maybe at the end of it all, you go on Quora and try and basically ask existential questions about why you're doing this in the first place. Now, this supplemental activity becomes a very important part of the collective knowledge that's being produced. Because for the first time ever in human history, we can not only process our own perspectives that underlies knowledge naturally, but we can also now not only express but visibly project it so that it forms part of the discourse of the knowledge itself and we can explore and interact with those of others. So through digital media, knowledge has become networked, something that is constantly moving, actively evolving, something that is not stationary. And when you take this into account and into mind, and you think back to how we used to consume information through print, that really was a foolish ideal because knowledge obviously does not ex exist in a vacuum. It exists as part of a wider social context, something that is evidently superfluous, ever-changing, but yet equally important to actually be able to access and be a part of if we truly want to build a comprehensive understanding of anything. And this is why the print publishers that make up the elite you know, of the past are not really quickly becoming the dinosaurs of the digital age. And this is why we, o we often hear how print is dead. Now, there's no denying that the figures for revenue, subscriptions, output has been diminishing year on year. And while some of you sitting here today, especially some of the more elderly ones here, you may disagree that print is dying, you can't deny that the days of kids sneaking up to the treehouse to read their favorite magazines, or you sitting across a commuter pouring through his glossy cover, they're now long gone. And the reason why this is happening is because a lot of the producers of content, producers of knowledge, they fail to realize how the landscape is actually changing, how technology has actually given way to a more accessible avenue of knowledge creation itself. And today, having explored the accessibility and how through technology we now have a more active role, we should all ask ourselves what role we want to play in this new age and ultimately whether we want to empower the lives of others by being a part of this conversation. Thank you very much.